In this video, we are going to be discussing Costal Lewis approach to chemical bonding. First of all, somebody reached out to me and asked if I could cover this chapter, and I really thank you. Uh, you know, these comments and stuff are the one are the ones that keep me going working on this channel. So I thank you for commenting and requesting for this. Um, so Castle Lewis approach to chemical bonding. Basically, I mean, I know I covered this topic a while ago. By a while ago, I mean almost two years ago. And in that, I'm just going to leave that video up. I have not checked what I discussed there, but basically we'll be discussing the exact same topic again. Um, so basically, this particular approach was given by two scientists. They were Kossel, oh sorry, Walter Ludwig Julius Kossel, who was a German physicist, and Gilbert Newton Lewis, who was an American physical chemist. Physical chemistry is hard. So these two scientists worked independently and they were the ones who were the first to come up with this sort of thing which made sense at that point in time. So this particular uh, approach came out in the year 1916. Okay, now basically both of them worked independently and they came up to a conclusion that, uh, I mean, that it all of it, the chemical bonding is related to the balance electrons and in this video we will be talking about the Lewis approach we will also be talking about the Lewis structures how to draw them and the significance of a Lewis structure so basically according to Lewis what he thought was he thought that the atom is consists of two parts okay it consists of how many parts two parts the first one is the kernel which is positively charged and the other one is the cube. So what he said was that your atom consists of the kernel, which is in the center. This kernel consists of your inner electrons and the nucleus. And obviously, since your inner electrons are going to be like because of this, because it doesn't include the outer electrons, you have a positive charge. The kernel is going to be positively charged. And then he said that the cube is going to be the outside. Okay, I am no artist, but this cube is beautiful. Also, it's been a long day at work. So, um, so this is your, this is the kernel. And this is the cube that's around it. So the cube is basically the outermost shell. Okay, outermost shell and this is going to be the kernel which is positively charged which consists of the inner electrons and the nucleus. Now what he said was that you have electrons occupying each of these corners. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there can be eight electrons occupying the corners and when the eight electrons are full, it's an inert gas. Okay, so let's take an example, right? For example, sodium. Sodium's atomic number is 11. Okay, according to your Bohr's theory, and in a second I'll tell you why we're considering Bohr's. I mean, it's easier for in my head for you to pictureize it, I think, because I learned that in the beginning. So you have your nucleus in the center. You have two electrons in the first shell. You have eight electrons in the second shell. And you have just one electron in the third shell. So according to Lewis, what he said was all of this is going to be the kernel and this one right here so for sodium it would basically be just oh i guess i shouldn't have erased all of that but it'll just be one electron i just kill that cube anyways so it'll just have one electron in the outermost shell okay whereas in case of an element like neon you will have eight electrons in the outermost shell, so it will all be occupied. And if I'm not wrong, helium neon. So neon's atomic number is 10. So it would just not have this outermost shell. 
So then in that case, the uh, like this shell I meant, but it, the outermost shell itself consists of eight electrons. So that's what Lewis said. Lewis said that your outermost electron shell should have eight electrons. And obviously the exception is going to be helium, and who's, which is an inert gas, but because of its atomic number being two, it'll only have two electrons. Okay, so that's the exception. But basically this is the norm. So according to what... I mean, Lewis said he postulated that atoms achieve the stable octet when they are linked by chemical bonds. So, because like for sodium, you, you have sodium, right? So the sodium uh, Na has a tendency to lose electrons and form Na plus. Cl chloride chlorine has a tendency to gain electrons and form cl minus so he said that because they all both want to maintain the octet state because of that they tend to undergo chemical bonding and that's how all of these bonds are formed okay i hope that made sense so what he said was that he introduced a notation called the lewis symbol okay what's it called the lewis symbol So, the Lewis symbol basically has the representation of the outermost shell, okay? Now, if you think about it, uh, let's write down the atomic. Lithium, this is the elements of your second period. So, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, okay? These are all the elements in the periodic table, right? Now, lithium, the atomic number is 3, beryllium is 4, Boron is 5, carbon is 6, nitrogen is 7, oxygen 8, fluorine 9, neon 10. Now, I hope, oh, I forgot to tell you, sorry. The reason I considered Bohr's model was because at that point in time in 1913 was when Bohr's model came out. And that was what was considered uh, when they came up with this approach. In my, like, that's what I figured. That's what I came to a conclusion to that they realized that oh maybe the octet is the reason why they you know elements form bonds so lithium has atomic number of three so if you think about it you'll have two electrons in the inner shell so the outermost uh, shell has just one electron so the number of electrons in the outermost shell is just one for lithium. So we will represent it, the inner shell along with the nucleus, that is the kernel, as the symbol of the element itself. And then it will have just one electron. So one dot. So you can either use the dot or you can use the an X, either or. Okay, you just need to use a dot or an X to show the... Um, electron on the outermost shell beryllium 2 minus 4 that is 2 so you have two electrons for beryllium so you'll just say be 1 2 or you can write 1 2 okay now you'd be next let's go to boron boron is 5 5 minus 2 equals to 3 because you'll have two electrons in the inner shell so you have three electrons in the outer shell. So you have boron, one, two, three, right? The fourth one is carbon. Carbon, six minus two equals to four. So carbon, one, two, three, four. Now you might be wondering, oh, it makes sense for us to have just written Be, one, two, boron, one, two, three, carbon, one, two, three, four. But you don't do that. That is wrong. So basically what we're doing is, if you remember for, uh, I'm sure you know like how uh, the orbitals work, right? So when you have, let's say a D orbital, I know I should have picked something smaller. One, two, three, four, five, five. So you have the D orbital. Now let's say you have six electrons. You would not say one, two, three, four, five, six. This is absolutely incorrect. We'll go a half fill and then you will fill it up. Right. Similarly, over here, what we do is we start clockwise. So for nitrogen, 7 minus 2 equals to 5. So you have 5 electrons. So nitrogen, we'll start with the top. Let's go clockwise. 3, 4. And the fifth one is going to be like this. 
okay please do not memorize that's what i did when i was a student do not memorize this basically what we're doing is we are just filling it up in a clockwise direction and pairing it up only after all the four spots have been occupied so oxygen will have how many eight minus two is six so one two three four five six okay fluorine is nine minus two that is seven so one two three four five six seven right um and then you have neon which is one two three four five six seven eight so 10 minus 2 is 8 and you are able to fill in the electrons. Please do not memorize this. Please do not write it incorrectly. Basically, you have the uh, lone pair of electrons for nitrogen. So this denotes that it has a lone pair of electrons. So we are doing it clockwise. And then after each of these four spots are occupied, only then can we start pairing them up. It's somewhat similar to what you have with the orbitals. Do not memorize it. That's what I did when I was a student and I don't know why I did that. But this is what I figured um, so it's essentially like it's a square. So you do start filling it up from the front and then you pair it up on the opposite side. Right. So that's what is happening over here. Um, so the reason, the significance of the Lewis symbol is obviously the fact that it indicates the number of electrons on the valence shell. Based on this, you're able to figure out the number of valence electrons for a particular element. Not just that, it also will denote the valency. At this point, I hope you know the concept of valency. Valency is the combining capacity of an atom. So it, the Lewis symbol is also able to give us the valency. In case of elements like lithium, beryllium, boron, and carbon, the number of electrons in the valence shell are going to be equal to the valency. So you have valency for lithium is one, beryllium is two, boron is three, carbon is four. Now when we start from nitrogen, it will be eight minus the number of electrons in the valence shell. So eight minus five, that is equal to three. Oxygen is nine minus, oh, eight minus six that is equal to 2, that's the valency, and fluorine is 8 minus 7, that is equal to 1, that is the valency. So the Lewis symbol is able to give us the valency of the particular element. So in this case, you have lithium is monovalent, beryllium is divalent, boron trivalent, carbon tetravalent, nitrogen trivalent again, Oxygen, divalent, and fluorine is monovalent. And I hope you know the concept of valency. If you do not, just definitely let me know. I'm not sure if I have a video about that. And so obviously it also gives us the group valency. In a periodic table, each group has a similar valency. That's how you have that's what you learn in the beginning. So the Lewis symbol also gives us that. I hope all of that made sense. In the next video, we will be talking about what Castle was talking about.